We are rapidly approaching a recession. The Federal Reserve has gone into panic mode, watching inflation basically get away from them. We'll see a pivot at some point, most likely next spring or next summer. I think it's going to be seen as capitulation, and the markets, I think, are going to react very badly. This is Kaiser Johnson with Liberty and Finance, and this is the Miles Franklin Weekly Special for November 8th through 15th, 2022, while supplies last. This week, we've secured a shipment of backdated silver maples, including full mint-sealed monster boxes from years prior to 2022, and they are available at $8.50 over spot. The silver maple, made by the Royal Canadian Mint, is four nines fine and was the first bullion coin minted to that exemplary purity. They are one of the most recognized bullion coins in the world and come in tubes of 25 and boxes of 500. Again, we have them at $8.50 over spot while this special lasts. Finally, the Canadian silver maple is IRA eligible. And if you'd like to learn more about a precious metals IRA, call us and we'll be happy to help you in that process. Our number for all orders is 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237 and we're available after hours and on weekends, and we look forward to speaking with you. Welcome back to Liberty and Finance. We're delighted to have this well-respected returning guest. Jim Rawls is the founder and host of survivalblog.com. He joins us this Monday, November 7th, 2022. Jim, thanks for coming back on Liberty and Finance. Thanks for having me on. You've been a long time guest on our channel ever since we were reluctant preppers and the focus we've often had with you is about physical preparedness and uh, weapons and uh, precious metals and other, other forms of preparedness wide ranging frankly across many uh, forms and aspects of self-reliance etc. There seems to be a coming I guess a cusp of concern around risks that we're facing due to changes in our financial world, uh, focusing partly on the advent of the cashless society, central bank digital currencies, complete loss of privacy and freedom to uh, basically live our, our financial lives holding onto the fruits of our labor in ways that are stable and preserve purchasing power and give us the privacy and flexibility to do that as we see fit. That's one focus that uh, several viewers had submitted questions about. We want to talk about that with you. The second is about whether the upcoming midterm elections are likely to be an inflection point. That's tomorrow uh, and uh, by the time this airs will be quite current. Uh, whether those are likely to be a, a tipping point or a shift in the balance of power, or if it's just a changing of the guard between uh, two wings of the same bird that uh, the part of the collectivist uh, sort of front that's been uh, basically absorbing all of our freedoms and privacies over the past couple of decades and beyond. Uh, we'd like to get you your way in on the impact of the midterms. So could we start off with that question about the change in our financial lives and how close you believe a major uh, impact is coming to our financial lives uh, due to unfolding events in, in the uh, debt, the, the currency markets, et cetera, and central bank digital currencies being part of that. Uh, if you wanna give us kind of your helicopter's eye view of the landscape first, and then we have some specific questions about preparedness in the face of that that have been submitted by viewers. Sure. Well, I guess to begin with, I think from a 30,000 foot view, uh, we are rapidly approaching a recession. The uh, Federal Reserve has gone into panic mode, watching uh, inflation basically get away from them. Uh, I think our current Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell is um, not likely to stay the course on a tight money environment. He's basically no Paul Volcker. Back uh, during the Carter administration, the, uh, uh, the chairman of the Federal Reserve was Paul Volcker, and he had the intestinal fortitude to raise interest rates to the same level to match inflation, to, to really stop inflation. I don't think that Jerome Powell is gonna have those kind of guts. And 
We'll see a pivot at some point, most likely next spring or next summer, uh, certainly before the end of the Biden administration. And uh, when that happens, that's going to do several things. One is it's going to absolutely kill the um, real estate market um, because even with interest rates uh, mm -hmm. dropping, everyone's going to see it as a signal for mass inflation. And basically, the equities markets, the real estate market, uh, the, uh, the private car ownership market, and, and the debt that goes along with that, all of those you would think would um, begin to recover as interest rates start to drop again. But I don't see that happening. I think it's going to be seen as capitulation. And the markets, I think, are going to react very badly. Now, as for central bank digital currencies, I think those are definitely in the works. You can see uh, the, the war drums are, are beating right now against private cryptos. Because obviously, as the governments get ready to release uh, their sovereign cryptos, the CBDCs, uh, they hate competition. And they're going to want to run all of the private cryptos out of the market by, by regulation, by taxation, and uh, most importantly, by regulation of the crypto exchanges. I think that's where they're going to have the greatest impact. And if there's basically no place to exchange crypto, it's going to kill crypto. And we'll see the price of uh, all the major cryptos um, with Bitcoin, and Ethereum and, and whatever. Uh, the bottom's just going to drop out of those at that point. Once they declare war on the cryptos, it's all over for private cryptos, at least here in the United States. As people have been asking how they can prepare for what they see as a coming uh, convulsive breakdown of our existing financial system. We've certainly seen, uh, as you mentioned, inflation a few moments ago, loss of purchasing power of the dollar, uh, just a hockey stick ramp up in the creation of currency over the past two and a half years, and, and this rise in inflation that shows no sign of abating anytime soon. People are awakening to the fact of the collapsing value of anything denominated in dollars. There's a question specifically from a viewer on that is, what are the, from uh, Frickendel Special says, what are the most important things you can do to live outside the system of CBDCs? Wow. <laughs> it will be tough because once a central bank digital currency is put in place, it's just a short matter of time before they ban the use of paper currency, and there'll probably be extensive controls put on the use of foreign paper currency within the United States, and also moving paper currency, or even crypto for that matter, uh, in or out of the United States. They basically want CBDC uh, the, the digital dollar to be the only game in town. And if and when that happens, if they ban paper currencies and they make uh, coinage obsolete, I think the way they'll make them obsolete is basically to declare them null and void and basically give the green light for anyone to melt down their old coinage. Uh, once that happens, it you know, all bets are off in, in terms of of privacy, because unlike private cryptos, sovereign cryptos um, have full transparency to the government. With private cryptos, you have an opaque market. Basically, the only ones who know what's going on are the buyer and the seller in that market, whoever's transferring those funds. Uh, it's all private. With a sovereign crypto with a central bank digital currency is completely transparent. It's transparent for tax purposes. It's transparent for uh, all sorts of legislative purposes. If um, 
if the nanny state decides that you are drinking too many sugary drinks, they'll they'll they can literally at the at the uh, at the flip of a switch or with the activiza activation by a, a AI, artificial intelligence, they can limit your purchases of any number of different goods. If they think you've bought too much food that month, you get cut off. If you think you've, uh, you shouldn't have the right to travel for some reason, uh, you won't be able to buy an air airplane ticket or a train ticket or gasoline. They can build all that into the system. Essentially, it's like the, the Chinese social credit score system run amok. So CBDCs uh, represent a huge loss of freedom to people and certainly a loss of privacy. And the only way around it, unfortunately, if they do what I think they're going to do, which is uh, make the old paper currency obsolete and ban the use of foreign currencies and cryptocurrencies, is barter. And unfortunately, uh, though barter is a, a wonderful system and a long time traditional system, logistically, it's a nightmare because unless you're dealing locally, how can you barter physical goods over a long distance? It just isn't practicable. So that's where I stand on um, CBDCs. Uh, I think people should be prepared to barter. They should be prepared to live outside the system. And for the, to be able to barter, you need to have barter goods. So that means um, not just having a great big fuel storage tank for your own vehicles, but buying a whole bunch of, of extra gas cans so that you can literally barter gasoline and diesel fuel. Uh, it means stocking up on ammunition for all the guns you own and more, because you want to the, the, the more is common caliber ammunition that would be useful for barter, things, uh, the ammunition that you think that your neighbors might need and be willing to, tr to trade for the other things that you need in barter. So think ahead and think through all of the potential barter transactions that you'll have to make. And for those who want to live completely outside of the system, who refuse to even get a CBDC account, that's going to leave you in a very difficult situation because you still have to be able to pay your property taxes and things like car registration and insurance and your utility bills. So try to identify alternative ways to make those transactions, either by means of barter in precious metals or ammunition or whatever with a a friend or a neighbor or a fellow church congregate who is in the system who can make those payments for, for you out of their CBDC funds, you'd be bartering with them probably at a slight loss, and then they would be making those payments for you. Otherwise, without making those payments, you would become persona non grata very quickly, and given the history of taxing officials here in the United States, you would also become homeless in short order. You mentioned just briefly there at the end, um, precious metals, among other more, I guess, um, uh, commodity-based uh, barter goods. What, what do you see as the role, the likely role of precious metals in a barter economy? And do you see similar uh, crackdowns on that, as you mentioned, for paper cash or foreign currency or that or com or private? Uh, cryptos, et cetera. Yes, there very well could be a crackdown on the use of precious metals. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier that, that governments hate competition. I always like to think of governments as something like the mafia, but with a flag. Uh, they basically operate the same way. They're a giant protection racket. They want to be the only provider of that protection, and they hate competition. So um, they'll look at the use of foreign currency, the use of precious metals uh, in barter as a threat to their economic hegemony. And obviously, there's going to be massive noncompliance if CBDCs are rolled out and they're the only game in town. 
Obviously, people are going to be using barter on, on a very large scale. And if you make your communications private, and the only real private means of communication between buyer and seller that are that's totally private is face to face. Uh, that's the any other method is likely to be intercepted, decrypted, or whatever. Um, so don't count on those uh, any other method of communication being private. Make the communication private. Make the transfer of the physical tangible wealth, whether it's uh, a Swiss watch or a uh, Krugerrand or an American Eagle or a, uh, a brick of 22 long rifle ammunition, make that private as well. And then your chances of being detected are going to be minimal. And I think that's an acceptable level of risk. Anything beyond that, though, where you're depending on um, a encrypted chat message or uh, some sort of encrypted communication or just a regular phone call. Um, so either face to face communication or a good old fashioned hard copy letter with a stamp on it is about your only secure means of communication that's going to be left. There's also concern in our current environment has been changing. Uh, it's ironic about there used to be the saying, if you see something, say something. And now over the last two and a half years, there's been so many things where if you said something, you got whacked or deplatformed or, or labeled with a fake news or false, uh, uh, you know, un unverified or whatever, uh, to the point where now there's even networks of uh, being promoted, as you say, uh, like a mafia with a flag, uh, in the name of um, the, the, the public good or the safety of the community, informing on your neighbors and friends if they aren't uh, doing the, the current, um, you know, aren't towing the line. And so is, is, that a, is that an additional risk that people need to keep in mind if they're bartering and that sort of thing is even gaining a local reputation in your local community as, you know, oh, Billy Bob here, uh, is, you can barter with him. Uh, once that becomes known, that there's likely to become someone who believes that it's their civic duty or whatever to report that to the authorities. Yes, conceivably. It all depends on where you live. And, you know, I've always been a big proponent of moving to a lightly populated, rural, remote agricultural area or ranching area. Um, there, the the chances of remaining anonymous and not raising the suspicion of the authorities are much higher. Uh, if you're in a suburban environment or or certainly an urban environment, your chances of remaining anonymous for an extended period of time are pretty low. Now, uh, it's all going to be a matter of big fish and little fish, though. In the eyes of the authorities. Uh, somebody running a garage sale and accepting, you know, eggs in barter <laughs> is probably not going to be seen as a big threat and not likely, you know, to have the local gendarmes uh, sent out to knock on your door versus someone who uh, runs a used car lot and develops a reputation of being willing to accept payment in precious metals. Someone like that is going to have the, the weight of the authorities come down on them like a ton of bricks. So it's all relative. It's, it's relative to the scale in which you are conducting barter and the prevailing attitudes and population density of where you live. Basically, fewer people mean fewer p problems. And uh, if you live in a rural county where I do, you're probably going to end up with a local county sheriff who's actually fairly sympathetic. Um, certainly uh, in terms of firearms transactions, uh, most small town sheriffs are very pro-gun. So um, again, vote with your feet. If you haven't already, folks, it's high time to move to a lightly populated area. And with the enabling technologies that exist now, there's so many people who are now able to work from home uh, at least certainly most office workers um, can usually work out arrangements to work from home.
the technologies are there to allow you to live in a very lightly populated area, literally the middle of nowhere, because now uh, photovoltaic power technology is really mature and is down below a dollar per watt. It's mature technology. And we have Starlink coming online. I'm speaking to you right now through Starlink. So, um, and there's hardly any delay, you know, unlike HughesNet and the other satellite internet services that had like a quarter second delay. And that means a quarter second may not sound like much, but it's actually enough to disrupt a normal conversation. Those satellites were in a fairly high Earth orbit. Starlink satellites are in low Earth or orbit, so the delay is minimal. It's, it's less than a tenth of a second and it's not noticeable in, in conversation. So the technology is there to allow people to move to the boonies. And my question is, folks, why haven't you already done so? Back uh, on the question of uh, precious metals and things that may change in the way that they are used or uh, how private they can be, etc. Another question is about government confiscation. It's certainly been a concern, at least since 1933 in the U.S., although that was more properly referred to as nationalization, not confiscation back then. Uh, Eight Weight Fly Rod asks, what is the risk of a central bank confiscation of gold? With And with silver having more industrial uses, what is the risk of a silver confiscation? So could you give us your view of potential government nationalization or confiscation or other uh, controls or restrictions or constraints put on precious metals? Yeah, I think the uh, you're right. The, the greater risk is with gold rather than silver. Uh, simply the volume of gold, you know, um, right now um, the ratio of silver to gold pricing is around, what, 85 to 1. It's been as, as recently it's been as high as 100 to 1. The logistics of calling in all of the silver in the country would be absolutely daunting to government authorities. The, the weight and volume alone would make it very, very difficult. And, um, you know, it's, as I mentioned before, it's also a matter of big fish and little fish. Uh, gold and platinum may be seen as the big fish. Uh, silver is, is going to be considered chump change by comparison. I don't think they're going to go actively try to call in all the silver in the country. Now, if someone's using a lot of silver for barter, that may come to the attention of authorities and they may clamp down uh, simply for, uh, you know, tax purposes in terms of uh, avoiding taxation. But um, I do think it's more likely that if there is a problem, it's going to be with gold. I've always been a big believer in silver. Uh, for several reasons. One is it's more efficient for barter. Uh, gold is simply too compact a form of wealth for efficient barter. Yes, you could use a cold chisel, but uh, <laughs> it's hard to make change out of a one ounce gold coin. It's really easy to make change if you're dealing with silver dimes and quarters minted in 1965. And uh, any thoughts uh, further? This is a question asked about because silver has more industrial uses. Does that imply that there's going to be just so many legitimate reasons why people in small businesses or whatever would need to have silver that it's it's not realistic for them to require that to be turned in? Just think of your your local dentist. You know, they can't they might be able to ban the possession of gold or at least gold coins, but. Uh, your local dentist is not going to be able to operate unless he has access to silver. Uh, they can't ban silver. Uh, so I think that uh, if you think in terms of the dental industry, the photographic industry, uh, there's a tremendous number, and of course electronics, there's a tremendous number of uses for silver uh, that don't make it practicable uh, for it to all be called in. Uh, a lot of the economy would come to a screeching halt and people's you know, teeth will suffer. <laughs> There's also uh, some more, I guess, traditional preparedness and survival questions that were submitted ahead of your arrival here. One of them is about water filtration. It's certainly very foundational on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You know, you can't get more than whatever it is, three days without water and stay healthy. Uh, Salvatore Livreri says... Can James discuss water filtration for lake or river water without the use of any electricity, chemicals, or burning of wood to boil? In other words, a real off-grid solution. Okay. Well, there's a number of solutions out there. Um, 
the e- certainly the easiest is bringing water right near a boil. Um, if you're treating water from open sources, so from creeks, ponds, streams, or, or rainwater off of your, your roof. Um, the second, of course, would be uh, water purification tablets. Um, like, for example, one of my affiliate advertisers on my website is a company called Aquatabs. Um, and that's an inexpensive way of doing it. But for larger volumes and on a day-to-day basis, why expose yourself to chemicals? The best method would be a um, gravity water filter. And for those, I recommend two different types of filters. One for your for your bug out bag or your get home bag, I would recommend a small uh, filter made by a company called Katahdin. It's uh, it looks like it's written Katadyne. It's K A T A D Y N, uh, but it's spoken Katahdin. Uh, they make a backpack backpacker style water filter uh, that's good for to treat. Uh, you know, several thousand gallons, but then uh, at your at your home, sitting right on your on your countertop in your right next to your kitchen sink, you should have what's called a big Berkey filter, and it's uh, British Berkfield is the company, and it's Berkey with an E Y. It's B B E R K E Y. Uh, just do a web search on Big Berkey. And uh, they're fairly expensive. Um, you can also build your own. I have instructions at survivalblog.com on how to make your own big Berkey filter using a couple of five-gallon plastic buckets and then the uh, ceramic filter elements from British Berkfeld. You install those in, the, in a plastic bucket instead of their fancy stainless steel container. Uh, that'll save you about 70% on the cost of, of the equivalent of a big Berkey filter. In fact, one that actually has a little bit more volume because uh, you're going from one five-gallon bucket to another. So every family should have a, a big Berkey filter or an equivalent, and every everyone should ha- also have a Katahdin filter. And then, um, Again, aqua tabs work fine and bringing water near a boil works fine. If you're working from water from an open source, it's really important that you pre-filter that water through just a couple of thicknesses of T-shirts to get most of the large sediment and leaves and whatever out of the water before it goes through your gravity filter. And that'll greatly extend the life of your filter. Surprisingly enough, there's some uh, local considerations that may... Uh, require uh, special types of treatment. I know that we live in Northwest Ohio currently and near Lake Erie where there's a oh, many, many of the communities near us uh, source their water from Lake Erie in the summertime, especially that's known for these toxic algae blooms that produce uh, these, these mycotoxins, which surprisingly are not improved by boiling. Uh, it, it, there's a type of chemical toxin in the water that boiling doesn't, it actually concentrates it and it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, eliminate it. So that's where some of the other filtration methods involving activated carbon or et cetera will be helpful. Yeah, a, a, a black Berkey filter uh, will actually get rid of most of those contaminants, to the best of my knowledge. The standard white ceramic Berkey filters will not. Uh, so yeah, you're kind of in a quandary there. Um, again, people should be living in the country and be on well water or sp- Water. <laughs> but if they can't afford to or move to the country or they can't move because of their work situation or uh, family commitments, you know, they may have someone may have an elderly relative they may need to stay with. And it's not practical for them to move with that elderly family member. I certainly can appreciate that. Just identify some local sources of water that are small sources. So. Uh, convert your uh, roof gutter drain uh, downspouts uh, to be filling wa- water barrels, for example. It's probably the easiest way if you don't want to be working from a contaminated aquifer or, uh, or a contaminated lake, or work from small streams which are fed from rainwater runoff. Uh, Obviously, you have to to treat that a little bit more heavily than you would um, rainwater from your roof. But 
that's another good way to avoid contaminated groundwater. Jim, as you look towards the midterm elections, uh, what are you seeing uh, either potential uh, improvements or pitfalls or just business as usual? Don't don't hang your hopes on it, folks. Uh, what, what's your overall approach? And are you have any specific uh, philosophies that may be helpful to people? I'm afraid my opinion is it goes with the old song, uh, meet the new boss, same as the old boss. Um, where, where folks are going to get fooled again. Uh, the the differences between the mainstream Republican Party and the Democrat Party are actually fairly minimal at this point. And if you look at some of the shenanigans that's gone on with the rhino Republicans making deals with the Democrats in Congress, it's not very encouraging. There's really not a nickel's worth of difference between the two parties. Uh, you know, granted, there's a, a few really uh, true conservative libertarian politicians out there they're true statesmen but they're in the in the minority you know the the, the christy noams and the rand pauls of the world are few and far between the majority of the republicans out there are going along with the mitch mcconnell's of the world the mainstream republicans and they're still playing politics as usual so don't hold out a lot of hope for the election yes it will probably result in a Republican majority in both the House and the Senate. That is, if the election uh, vote counting process is not monkeyed with. But even that majority is probably not going to accomplish a lot. If you look at the last time that we had a, a good majority, it was right after Trump came in office. So we had a Republican majority in the House, in the Senate, and we had a Republican in the White House and the Republican leadership absolutely squandered that victory for two years because they didn't want to have Donald Trump be seen as, as victorious on any of his policies because they were never Trumpers. So that's the kind of situation I think we're, we're going to be in uh, with a new Republican majority coming up. And, of course, we'll still have a Democrat in the White House. So I don't think a lot is going to happen legislatively. So don't hold out a lot of hope, folks. Jim, if people want to follow your work, and you certainly got an extensive library of reference materials available for people, as well as current writings that continue to come out, where should they get plugged in? Sure, they can look at survivalblog.com, just the way it sounds, survivalblog.com, all one word. And that website's been up since 2005. It's been posted daily with daily updates ever since 2005. There's well over 30,000 archived articles, letters, columns, all fully available, free of charge. There is no secret members only area or whatever. It's all free of charge. Please folks, dig into those archives. Uh, yes, we do sell a, a USB stick with the archives, but there's no reason why you can't just download all the, down, the archives yourself incrementally. Find the articles that you find useful, save those to a memory stick, and the most important ones you should print out in hard copy form. We never know when we're going to have a grid down collapse. And if you need instructions on how to, you know, build a, a water filter or a fuel transfer pump, you should, re should really have those kind of articles in hard copy form in a binder. And folks, so that you don't miss a single interview here on Liberty and Finance, including any of our interviews with Jim Rawls, make sure you go to libertyandfinance.com, put in your name, your at email address, click submit, and then make sure you confirm on the confirmation email that you get, and you'll get our once a day uh, newsletter, which is our latest interview and any specials. So you'll miss, you'll uh, make sure you don't miss a single interview with any of our guests, including those with Jim. And uh, we just thank you, Jim, on behalf of all of our viewers for joining us here on Liberty and Finance. Thank you so much, and God bless you and all your listeners. Thank you, Jim. Miles Franklin Precious Metals is one of America's oldest and most trusted bullion dealers. Miles Franklin is A-plus rated and accredited by the Better Business Bureau, licensed and bonded, and has zero complaints ever registered. Here at Liberty and Finance, we are licensed brokers with Miles Franklin. To order, simply call us, discuss your needs, and we will let you know our live inventory, prices, and availability, and lock in your order over the phone. Once your order is locked, 
The price is held for you regardless of market fluctuations, and the metals are reserved for you awaiting your settled payment. Within one business day of ordering, you will receive an email invoice detailing the order and payment instructions. Miles Franklin accepts payments by bank wire, ACH or electronic check, money order, check mailed priority mail, and cryptocurrency. The fastest forms of payment are bank wire and cryptocurrency. Upon settled payment, metals will ship out within three to five business days. You will receive tracking information via email. Domestic shipping charges are $15 for any order under 500 ounces of silver or 10 ounces of gold. For orders larger than that, domestic shipping is free. The package will be double boxed, fully insured, and labeled discreetly, with no indication of the contents inside. For your privacy, the name Miles Franklin will not even be on the package. To talk to myself, Elijah, my brother Kaiser, or my father Dunnigan, call 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237.